Hey guys, and welcome back to another Lost Bits video right here on Tetra Bay Gaming, the series where we explore the unused, altered, and unseen content in gaming. Poppy Playtime Chapter 3 is finally out, and so we are back here covering it on this series. Chapter 2 was an absolute goldmine of unused content. Will Chapter 3 follow in its footsteps? I guess time will tell. But for this first video, we'll be going over a whole bunch of unused maps left over in the game that give us a glimpse into the early development stages of this chapter. Before we jump in though, I'd like to thank Opera GX for sponsoring this video. Default internet browsers are scaring away your computer's resources, although I guess they're less furry than Huggy Wuggy. Opera GX offers GX Control, which lets you supercharge your PC's gaming performance when having a browser open. So you can listen to music, open up a whole bunch of tabs to watch several of my videos at the same time, whatever, all while being in control of how much CPU and RAM usage you want to dedicate. For example, here's a comparison of me running the exact same tabs between the two browsers. Opera GX also got smarter, with AI integration with ChatGPT and smart AI prompts, and also to combat how boring typical browsers are, there are also GX mods which ramp up the customizability of your browsers with tons of features. Like if you're a big fan of Poppy Playtime, there's even a custom mod for that too that adds wallpapers, sounds, and more. There's no lengthy quick time events here either, as Opera GX offers a nifty quick import tool that lets you seamlessly import bookmarks, history, and more from your previous browser. So help support the channel and use my link below to make the switch to Opera GX today. And with all of that said, take a cat nap on that like button below, it's time to check out some Poppy Playtime Chapter 3 Lost Bits. Alright, so first let's do a bit of a found bits section here to talk about one thing in particular that was once unused, but has now finally been implemented as many of you have been leaving comments about this since Chapter 3 dropped. And this is, of course, the Huggy image that was left over unused way back in Chapter 1 of this game, which has seemingly been reused for the Hallucination Huggy VHS tape in the Nightmare segment of Home Sweet Home. When looking at them side by side, although definitely similar, we can see that they touched up the one that ended up being used here in Chapter 3 with the eyes looking different, and there being a lot less teeth, namely on the bottom of Huggy's mouth in the final one. And interestingly enough, the original Huggy image, now renamed to Huggy Scary in the files, actually once again remains unused in the files of Chapter 3. Well, mostly. We'll get into this more a bit later in this video. But in any case, really cool to see that an image left over unused in the game ended up being reused over two years later. And now, getting to the good stuff here, let's check out the handful of unused maps left over in Chapter 3. Starting off small, we got Entry, and I feel like we've seen these maps several times on the series by now, but yeah, it's literally just a cube. That's it. Nothing else to say here, really. Then, since it's the first section you play in in Chapter 3, let's now go to Intro Tunnels Blockout, which covers the intro of the game up to getting in the cable car which takes you to Playcare. So here let's start in the Trash Compactor Room, where we can see that at this point, it's pretty empty. But I guess this makes sense, since this is essentially a rough draft of the map with really basic models made to lay out how the area is planned to look. Then from here, we can go through this gap and see our first developer text of this video, as looking up, we can see placeholder text for I guess what was planned to be a sign instructing employees of the area that a safety harness is required for all repairs here. Not only did the sign not end up being placed here in the final version, but this whole platform that you'd have to squeeze through here was removed too. Then moving on, we can see an early mock-up of the piston platforming section, as well as the area above where we can also see a hole in the wall similar to what was made for the final version. What's also interesting is that here there seems to be another piston platforming area on the other side of the trash compactor. And this one is actually doable here, so this definitely looks like it could have been another way to get up to the top area. Then in the upper catwalk section here, in addition to some nice yellow and blue blocks, there's this strange floating grab pack hand with a red and black texture. Now this same red and black texture is later seen in this map, seemingly as a placeholder way to show a trail of blood. So maybe this was a placeholder for a bloody grab pack hand or something? And it can actually be interacted with too, as if you pull it with the grab pack, it will like open up, seemingly letting you go back down into the trash compactor below. 
Now, why you'd want to go back there isn't clear, but whatever the plan for this was, it was ultimately scrapped as there's nothing really like this here in the final version of this area. Near this area, we can also find a nice chunk of developer text indicating that this room here was meant to show the player the first gruesome indication of what Nappy Cat has done to the other toys here. Oh yeah, Catnap is referred to in the game's files numerous times as Nappy Cat, so it's quite likely that Nappy Cat was the original name for the creature before ultimately being changed. Honestly, I think Catnap rolls off the tongue much better, so I think this was a good change. Anyways, the final version of this area definitely succeeded in doing what it was planned to do based on this text. Then from here, we can go to the next area, which in the final version, we got the second piston platforming section, but here there aren't any pistons yet, at least that are visible. When you do get to the other side of the section, you can start to hear some thumping noises. And it turns out that these are actually caused by some objects clapping against each other just out of bounds here. I'm not quite sure what these were for, and the sound effect almost sounds like it was just made by a person going, do, 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 do. Also near these is an emergency control switch, which at first I thought that this would have made these stop or would have been controls for the compactor or something, but pulling the switch didn't seem to really do anything. Then looking to the right from the end of this area, we can get a nice view of a stiff model of Catnap just chilling here, and I guess this was a placeholder for his model that's seen crawling away here in the final version. It honestly just looks so goofy to see him grinning like this, almost like he knows we shouldn't be seeing him in this state. From here, we can pull open this vent covering to then crawl through it, which is easier said than done without proper lighting. Then in the room that follows, we can see some awesome placeholder models of a fridge, a pool table, this amazing looking TV, and more. I also love that the cupboards here use like little jail cell doors as a placeholder. There's also this placeholder for a poster that reads, Huggy can keep a secret, be like Huggy. And it mentions that the employees are contractually obligated to be like Huggy. I wonder to what extent. Anyways, just to give you guys a picture of how much this room was updated from this state, here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the two. Yeah. From here, we can also see a trail of blood that was supposedly left by the player as Catnap was dragging them to the garbage chute in the chapter's intro. So we can follow it back to see a restricted access door that was just changed to what looks like an unassuming elevator here by the green hand charge point. And no, unfortunately there isn't anything cool behind these doors. The blood trail then leads us to a door with more dev text, and this time, this sign was actually implemented into the final version, verbatim. In the next room, we can see an early version of the tube that Ollie sends down a battery through, as well as some more basic props. There's also a little secret hidden away though, as just above this room are some cubes in four colors that would make for a sweet logo. These seem to be an early setup for a puzzle of some sort, but whatever the plan for these was, never ended up being realized. Then through this door, we finally get to the train track area, where we can first see a nice basic version of the playcare sign which was used to tease this chapter back at the end of chapter 2, which oddly doesn't make an appearance in this game. And then there's also this big train crash here. Huh, <laughs> more like big octagonal prism crash, am I right? There's also instruction here to add particle effects to make it seem like the tunnels are at risk of collapsing, and I don't think this was something they really ended up doing here. Then moving on, we can see some nice rubble chunks on the tracks as we finally get to the entrance to the cable car to play care. The security room is here with only one TV rather than like 15, and so is the maintenance room. And although there isn't a placeholder power puzzle here yet, there is what looks to be an early model of a VHS tape. So it looks like originally there was a plan to have one of those in here as well. Then after passing the awesome looking low poly trees going up the stairs, we can see an early logo for Elliot's Express. And then lastly for this area, near the early cable car we can see some more dev text on each side saying, let's go, and then one for a watch your step warning. As far as out of bounds things here go, there's some of the usual stuff you might expect like a power puzzle, grab handle, and other random level objects here and there. But one of the weirdest things is that there's also a floating yellow Nintendo 64 controller found out of bounds here. Listed in the game's file simply as Blockout and 64 controller, 
Found just above the vent section before the lounge room, it's unclear what exactly this epic controller in all its three-pronged glory would have been for, but someone obviously put at least a bit of extra effort into making this, and they could have made any generic looking controller, but I guess whoever made this had some good taste. And this also turns out to be one of the very few objects in this early map that you can actually grab and carry around. But yeah, unfortunately, whatever the idea may have been for this seems to have been ultimately scrapped from this chapter. All in all, this map was really cool, and I thought it was awesome to get a look at this area and a bunch of the placeholder models from a much earlier point in development. Then moving on, next up we have a map titled Dome Environment that's found in an archive maps folder in the game's files. And as you'd expect, this is an early version of the main playcare dome area, though obviously a bit further along in development compared to the previous map. Here we start out in the maintenance area under the statue, and we can see a few notable differences. Although the strange looking generator with all the eyes is still here, this room lacks the sockets for all of the cords from the different areas around Playcare, there's no chute that's used by Ollie to send you down keys, and lastly, the computer is much different compared to how it's seen in the final, with this one having a bunch of small monitors instead of one bigger one, and then the main console here is just a big placeholder blue box. Then, if we try going up the stairs to the main area here, we can notice that it's blocked, as the grass geometry above is just straight up borked, preventing you from walking or jumping up through. But thankfully, I was able to teleport across, so I could explore the rest of the area to my heart's content. Although all of the main buildings here are where they should be, as you can see, the rest of the dome is… pretty empty. The area where you come down from the cable car is also unfinished, as basically everything from it hasn't been added here at this point, and even these stairs here are not only lacking proper textures, but even any collision, as you can just walk right through them. And furthermore, although the buildings are here, they're different compared to the final versions, as unlike there, where inside there's more stuff modeled and even some rooms that you can walk in, here, they're straight up just empty, so I guess this was from a point where the developers knew where they wanted the buildings to go, but they didn't finalize how their internals would be laid out just yet. Then, in addition to these weird blue boxes that are found all over the place with no seeming function, there's what looks to be an early version of the elevator that you go up with Poppy and Kissy in the game. The signs around the statue in the middle are here, but the buttons to activate them haven't been implemented here yet. The counselor's office building has a front wall detached and is missing the first level of steps that lets you walk around the sides and such. And then, probably the most interesting thing here is that the toy store looks quite different. Unlike in the final version where it's more decrepit and blocked off, this one is much more open. And we'll talk about this a bit more later in this video, but there's extremely strong evidence that reveals that the toy store was going to be another big area that the player was planned to visit that ended up being cut from this chapter. So if you were ever wondering why the toy store seemed like a more prominent building in the dome, even being one of the bigger highlighted ones on the map, yeah, the plan was originally for it to have a much bigger role in the game. Now, while we're on the topic of the dome, I'm not going to be diving into the out-of-bounds stuff in the used maps too much here because I didn't really find anything that crazy for the most part, but outside of the dome, I did find at least two of these orange canister things that I don't believe I've seen used anywhere else in this chapter, so I thought that was pretty neat. Oh, also, when flying around this map, I noticed something was hovering above the cable car, and it turns out it was actually a VCR player, and I guess this is how the developers got the intro message from Elliot Ludwig here to play inside, and it also appears that this is actually where the sound of the video is coming from. Although it looks a bit goofy from outside, it's quite a clever way of pulling this off. Then in the school map, just above the generator room are actually two models of Miss Delight, one of the creepy ruined one that's seen in the game, and then one of her all clean and looking brand spanking new, and I don't believe this model is ever seen used in the game, so it makes me wonder why it would be stashed way up here. In any case, it's pretty cool to see them contrasted like this, to see I guess how they were before and after the Hour of Joy. Also, I just realized this when editing this video, but the ruined version's eyes follow you wherever you go, which, thanks, I hate it. Oh, and on the note of Out of Bounds models, there's a squeezed looking catnap found Out of Bounds in the Home Sweet Home area. Just thought you should know. 
Now moving on, next we got a pair of early versions of the Gas Production Zone, the first of which is titled 1 Functionality Gas Production Zone Proto 3. First of all, typically maps with functionality in the name only loads parts of the map that have, well, functionality, so unfortunately we don't get the whole map here, but only some parts of it. Secondly, this file name references a Proto 3, which not only appears to reveal that this map was from a build of the game titled as such, but also suggests the existence of two more prototype builds that predated this one that are out there somewhere. My fingers are definitely crossed that hopefully one day we might get to access these. Anyways, here we get to see an incredibly early version of the gas production zone, including stuff like a very early main computer, some really basic wiring around the area, some early main gas tube things with the raised one I guess indicating where the red gas was being held, we can see some early placeholders for the purple hand panels, a grab pack here I guess as a placeholder for the grab pack 2.0 where you unlock the purple hand, then we got some power node things, as well as early elevators for the final boss fight, as well as for the ending of the game. There wasn't much else that stood out to me, but it was just really cool to see this area in an early state like this. Then next we got 2 Blockout Gas Production Zone Proto 3, so also from the same prototype build I guess, but the 2 at the start I suppose suggests a second iteration here. Also, this time around it's a blockout map, so it's much more complete looking than the previous area. From the entrance, we can see some different models for the main computer and cylinders here, there's this big lab sign which looks like it was moved here in the final version. The section for the first purple hand puzzle platforming area is roughly put together here, though lacking any of the actual bounce pads. And similarly, we also have a very early makeup of the controller power puzzle room, here referred to as Control Center A. But probably the most interesting thing about the early version of this room is that it appears to reveal where the elevator at the end of the chapter might be taking us, as in this room is some big developer text reading, PRISON. Now this room itself certainly doesn't resemble a prison in the final version, so I'm willing to bet that originally the plan was for this sign to tease where the next chapter would take place, similar to how at the end of chapter 2 we saw the playcare sign. Now this sign does appear to be crudely covered up with some shapes, so perhaps it was around this point in development where the developers were deciding to scrap this sign idea to make it more of a mystery where the next chapter will go. Though in the files there is actually a finished texture for a prison sign too, so who knows. But I am willing to bet that chapter 4 will end up taking place in a prison area, so if this does end up getting revealed in chapter 4, come back and let me know if I was right or wrong. Anyways, moving on, next up we have my favorite of the early maps, and probably the most interesting, an early version of the hallucination section in Home Sweet Home, referred to in the files as Dream 1, with this early version listed as Dream 1. Now here we start things off in a room much different to the one seen in the final, and not only in that it looks more basic, but we also have a fountain with water coming out of a statue of Poppy, and instead of just a creepy room, this looks like a foyer entrance of sorts with a bigger sign for Home Sweet Home, and then we also have two placeholder statues, one for Elliot Ludwig, the founder of Playtime Company, as well as Stella Graber, who is revealed to have been the head of Playcare in this chapter. I gotta say though, I love the placeholder model for these statues, they're just so chonky looking. But the real fun of this area starts once we head down the lengthy staircase here where we can start to see some doors that don't quite line up with their frames, and then just like in the final version of this chapter, we are given the illusion of choice as we make our left and right turns at the radio junctions. And what's extra interesting is that this early version also uses some radio messages that are different from the ones heard in the final game. Here the radio messages mention the murder of a wife and her two kids by the father of the family, even going into details how he lured the daughter and son to do so, it's quite unsettling. I'll shut up now and let you listen to these cut messages in full. As the congressional debate over gun control flares up yet again, we regret to report the murder of a wife and her two children by their husband and father. The father purchased the rifle used in the crime at his local gun store two days earlier. This brutal killing took place while the family was gathered at home on a Sunday afternoon. Called 9-11, found the father in his car listening to the radio. Several days before the murder, he looked behind you. 
said, look behind you. Like he was chanting some strange spell. You've been chosen. The son came to investigate the commotion. The father shot him too. Don't touch that dial now. We're just getting started. His six-year-old daughter had the good sense to hide in the bathroom, but reports suggest he lured her out by telling her it was just a game. The girl was found shot once in the chest from point-blank range. And if these sounded familiar, they should, as to add to the obvious inspiration of this area from the 2014 demo of the cancelled game PT, these radio messages were straight up borrowed out of that game as placeholders here. Moving through the halls, we can also see a goofy early animation of Catnap looking at us and then scurrying away. In one of the halls here, we can also see an early version of the scratch mark messages saying the path ahead seems dim. And then another crazy thing in this early map that you might have already noticed is that the picture near some of the radios isn't of some orphaned kids, but it's of some scientists. And not just any scientists, these are actually the scientists from the Black Mesa Research Facility from Half-Life, and this is actually a texture from the game Half-Life 2. I just thought this was a really cool little placeholder to have chosen to be used here. Anyways, just like in the final version of this area, eventually you start to hear a phone ringing, and following the sound will lead you to an untextured room here with a model of a grab pack hand on a phone, and interacting with it will result in not Ollie chatting with you, but instead a really creepy voice telling you to run. And honestly, this one I think is a hundred times scarier. You need to run. The resulting little peek in by Catnap is much less scary though as he just awkwardly moves away again. After this, we get the last radio message that instructed the player to look behind them, and if the player does so here, they will see that the path they took to get to this radio has been sealed off. This doesn't end up happening in the final version of this area, though I think this would have made for a really cool effect there. Then if we disable lighting, we can see a goofy model of Catnap staring at us through this door. The next radio message here has some absolutely jammin' music that I don't think goes used anywhere else in the game. And then there's another creepy hallway where we can just see Catnap's eyes, but if we disable the lighting again, it becomes way more goofy than creepy. Eventually though, we get to the final room, which here is eerily referred to as the Smile Room, where as we approach, we get to hear the unsettling sound of children crying. And once inside, we can, go figure, see an early version of the room with placeholder models of basically everything there, including the TV from which Hallucination Huggy spawns from in the final version. And here we actually get the only early version of using a VCR as we can actually grab the placeholder VHS tape here and slap it into the VCR and yeah, this actually causes the original huggy image texture to show up on the TV. Unfortunately, the tape doesn't go away and just remains in our hand, but I just thought it was super cool to see the image here used like this. And this all but confirms that this image was indeed used as the basis for the Hallucination Huggy image that ended up being made for the final version of this area. So cool. And lastly for this area, if we take the camera out of bounds, just like in the final version, we can see the illusion of choice this map gives us, as no matter what path you take, you always end up going to the same destination. But what's extra interesting is that there's also a chunk of hallways disconnected from the rest way out here. There's nothing too exciting about these though, it just seems like each of the three main sections here uses a different texture for the walls, so perhaps this was a way to test how they would look and how they could transition between the different textures or something. Oh and yeah, there's yet another model of this goof just chilling at the end here as well. And then for the final unused early map, or at least for the ones that are more so complete, we have an early version of the final boss battle area listed as Final Encounter Blockout. And you know the drill by now, it's basically an early version with more basic placeholder models. 
We got some early sockets for the batteries, an early model for not only the green power node source, but some really basic looking models for the charge points that you need to bring the charge to in order to activate the even more basic looking pipes that blow out the steam. We can also see that this rusty platform here was used as a placeholder for the sliding door. And then lastly for this area, something that actually ended up getting cut from the final version is this large see-through pipe that leads to an also unused ammo box. Now I will talk about this more in a future video, but basically, originally the orange hand that you find in the game that lets you launch flares was planned to take ammo that you would find throughout the chapter instead of just auto-reloading on a timer. So I guess this shoot here would have likely been a way to infinitely get ammo during the boss fight against Catnap, suggesting that there were plans to incorporate the orange hand into the final fight so that all three special grab pack hands would be utilized instead of just the green and purple ones. I guess juggling all three hands might have been deemed too much to deal with, but I don't know. I wish the orange hand got a bit more use in this chapter, it just seemed to end up being a way to generate light in darker areas towards the end. And now, last up for this video is an unused map simply titled Dev Notes, and as the name suggests, this spawns us into a room with a whole bunch of dev text all over the place. Now, I'm assuming this was supposed to be loaded in alongside an early map so a dev could, well, see where all of these notes were for, but unfortunately, whatever map that may have been is no longer left over in the files. That said though, we can still kinda piece together where and what these were for. Phone Call 2 is the one that you get from Ollie when you first enter Playcare, so this was shortly after the cable car ride. There are more notes for phone calls when plugging in the home sweet home cord and grabbing the gas production zone key, so this was under the statue, and more. There's also this general note here in the middle for how the devs implemented some of the catnap interactions. And then looking around, we can also see some dev messages for the different buildings in Playcare. For starters, in the home sweet home section, we can see a placeholder location for the tape there, as well as references to Kissy Missy's room as well as Ollie's room. Now I'm not sure if the room we see Kissy Missy there was meant to be her room, but I don't think I recall ever seeing a room that was explicitly supposed to be Ollie's room there. Then not far from here we can see another tape, a placeholder for where you find the gas mask, and then various notes for radio messages, and this must have been for the hallucination sequence there. Then for the school area, we can see a placeholder for one of the teacher diary messages, the door that ends up crushing Miss Delight, and later a very early layout for the power puzzle where you have to bounce up with the purple hand, which based on this seems like it was originally planned to appear near the schoolhouse instead of the counselor's office as it's seen in the final. We then get to the cave area between the school and the playhouse, and here we can see probably the most interesting thing of this map. Not only is it a placeholder for the prototype shrine that's seen there in the final game, but here we can also see that it was planned to be placed here only if the toy store remained cut from the game. And since it did end up being placed here, yeah, that basically confirms that the toy store was planned to be another area the player would go through, but the decision was eventually made to scrap it. From here we can get to the playhouse entrance, but surprisingly there's not really anything else here for the playhouse, so next we go to the counselor's office building. Here we start near the tape that plays the emergency alert on several TVs throughout the hallway, and we can see quite a few placeholders for those here. We then get to a placeholder message for the cutscene in the game where we can see a Bunzo Bunny doll get absolutely trucked by Catnap. And then we can get to the building's generator, which ends up being the last one that the player needs to connect in this chapter. Then close by, there's another dev note, and this is actually another placeholder spot for the prototype shrine, only this time this is the spot that it would have been had the toy store area not been cut. And yup, you might have guessed it, since this is just to the right of the counselor's office from the middle, it appears that originally the plan was for the player to discover the prototype shrine in the Toy Store area. It was pretty cool to see it in the caves, but I think seeing a massive shrine in a creepy rundown toy store would have been super creepy too. And lastly for this area, we have the gas production zone, and here we got placeholder text for the red sludge from the gas machines that falling into would kill the player GG. 
There's a few more spots for where the phone calls from Hollywood start, and then interestingly there's also the Claire Harper tape here, which in the final game is actually the first one the player can obtain just after the trash compactor room, so I guess the plan was originally for it to be found here. We then see notes for the gas cylinders, the double arrowed button on the main computer, the lab sign which we also saw in the early blockout map I mentioned earlier, placeholders for where you get the grab pack 2.0, as well as the big blue battery slot, which it looks like was originally going to be more so a big power outlet than another slot for a battery. And then lastly, near the note for the poppy closing scene, we can once again see in big beautiful text that indeed the plan was for a big prison sign to have been revealed here. I'm definitely curious to see if they outright decided to change where the next chapter will take place, or if they just wanted to keep it a mystery for a while longer, but I guess only time will tell. But my friends, we'll wrap it up there for part 1 of these Poppy Playtime Chapter 3 Lost Bits, and I hope you enjoyed. It looks like we're about 30 minutes deep with this chapter's unused content, so off to a pretty good start, but there's lots more to cover, so I'm sure I'll have at least one more video for you guys. Till then though, check out some of my other Lost Bits videos, and be sure to subscribe to the channel and ring the bell to find your way back here in the future. And as always, thank you all so much for tuning in today, and I will see you in a bit.